In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Desperation. In the Gospel this morning, we encounter two very different people desperate for what Jesus has to offer. Jairus, a leader of the synagogue who holds some degree of authority in the community. A man that others may look up to, may admire, they may fear him, they may love him, or he may be hated. We don't know because we encountered Jesus, Jairus in a moment of desperation. He knows his daughter is dying, and no matter what he knows or has been told about this Jesus person, Jairus is willing to approach this itinerant preacher from the middle of nowhere. And we encounter a woman whose name we do not know. Jairus, in name dropped, it's name dropped in one paragraph, and simply a woman is referred to in the next. She has suffered an affliction for years, making her unclean, making her someone that nobody wanted to acknowledge, let alone help. Now, she has approached physicians, tests have been run, her body has been poked and prodded, medicines and elixirs have been tried, all without a cure. She has spent everything, and she has nothing to show for it. Nobody has been able to help her. Both are desperate. There is nowhere else to go, nobody else to see, but this wandering healer talked about by so many desperate for help in a hopeless situation. While not trying to sound like too much of an alarmist, some people believe that the Episcopal Church could possibly be entering into an era of desperation. Along with other mainline denominations, we are losing members at a pace that one prediction says we'll see the end of the Episcopal Church as we know it by 2050. Since 1980, our membership numbers have declined by over a third across this entire country. Fewer people means fewer people to do the work, to provide the assistance to do the things that this church tries to do. There is some de degree of good news in all this. If we compare 2021 to 2022, while our diocese lost 12% of our membership, the average of sun Sunday attendance, the ASA for those who keep track, increased by 15%. At least in the post-COVID world, people are coming back to church. But as I said, I don't want to sound too much like an alarmist. Across the church, people are discerning what the changes in our numbers, the views of many towards the church, and what it is that we are being called to do in faith community. This all revolves around mission and resources. As a reminder, I serve on the Reunification Discernment Committee, a group that's been meeting for about 18 months now to discern where or if the two dioceses of Bethlehem and central Pennsylvania should become one again. This study and the discussions we've had with our neighbors to the west reinforced my mind that we are all trying to figure this out together. The Diocese of Bethlehem and Central Pennsylvania are much more similar than not. The larger population centers of both run along the southern portion of both dioceses. Easton, Bethlehem, Allentown, Reading, Harrisburg, Lancaster, and York are large population centers, while pockets exist in the north, such as Scranton, Wilkesbury. Altoona, State College. There are a few parishes that are the size of this cathedral. Most are medium and smaller size. Rural parishes in both struggle with getting people to show up on a Sunday morning simply because of low population in the area that they serve. But why are we similar? Let's step back to a warm summer night some 400 million years ago. The, condition, the collision of two tectonic plates and the geological and climate changes during that time created the geography of Pennsylvania. Petroleum, 
and coal deposits, limestone, and the mountains that were formed that are more conducive to logging than farming, but also with fertile river valleys that supported far farming. The Susquehanna and Delaware rivers and their tributaries, including the Lehigh River, allowed for easier access to the interior of the state. And these rivers flow along or through both dioceses. The size and natural resources of Pennsylvania created an important center of industry during the American Civil War. 360,000 Pennsylvanians, including my great-great-grandfather, served in the Union Army. 100% of the Union's anthracite coal demand came from Pennsylvania, and nearly 80% of the iron demand. One of the most important battles was fought in Gettysburg, part of the Diocese of Central Pennsylvania. It was the boom in both manufacturing and population that drove a church growth in the post-Civil War era. The Diocese of Pittsburgh was formed in 1866, with talk of splitting the rest of the state starting after that. The Diocese of Central Pennsylvania was split off in 1870, and almost immediately talk about splitting that diocese began. By 1904, the Diocese of Central Pennsylvania and Harrisburg were formed. We were originally called the Diocese of Central Pennsylvania, as during the split, we were considered to be the old diocese and Harrisburg the new one. We adopted the name Bethlehem several years later, and Harrisburg reclaimed the Central Pennsylvania name in 1971. One could argue this was all done in desperation as well. By the standards of 1900, transportation and communication were challenges in an era of steam trains and real animals providing real horsepower. The telegraph was the fastest means of communication. There were no emails, video conference calls, no internet, nothing like the communication we have today. People were desperate for the word of God. Churches were growing, being planted, and being built. Our own growth and expansion activity in the city itself made it a driver throughout the region. There was a need and people responded. The Episcopal Church just ended its triennial convocation convention in uh, Louisville. I'm happy to say for those who remember Bishop Rowe, he has been elected our next presiding bishop for the next nine years. Two items of business were included these included the juncture of the Diocese of Eastern Michigan and Western Michigan. For the terminology that the Episcopal churches use, this is just basically a merger of the two dioceses to form the Diocese of the Great Lakes. Additionally, the three dioceses that were in Wisconsin, one of which could not afford to call a bishop, which is an important thing in the Episcopal church when that means bishops. They formed the three of them to become the Diocese of Wisconsin. The Diocese of Quincy and Chicago merged in 2013. North Texas and Texas merged in 2022. Besides our two dioceses, Northwestern Pennsylvania and Western New York have been in conversations but faced the challenge of state laws governing the existence of a single diocese across state lines. Indianapolis and Northern Indiana began discernment like ours in January of 2023. We also now have a presiding bishop cognizant of the cost of his office. It was announced that Bishop Sean's installation will be scaled back. While the pomp and circumstance of the National Cathedral is great, the realization that such an event will necessitate a lot of travel, thus reducing the carbon footprint of the event. Although it's not been printed, I wonder to myself whether or not he also is cognizant of the expenses. To send bishops across the country, across the world, to Washington, D.C. for probably what would be at least two nights, three nights of stay, plus airfare, is a lot of money that could be spent for other things. Being on our own reunification discernment committee, I've kept a close eye on the movements within the church and how that is shaping the future. When our committee first met, we decided that we needed to know more about our diocese, the history of where we came from, 
and how we fit into the wider church. A look at our numbers, membership, assets, and liabilities. What are we doing to make a difference to the world through mission and ministry? And finally, what are other dioceses struggling with and celebrating? Well, we found that the church in this part of Pennsylvania is small but mighty. Yes, we have many struggling parishes, but the ministries that they do for the communities around them is tremendous. Food, shelter, and clothing ministries, community action events, grant programs, prison ministry, educational programs, and social justice programs, to just name a few. And that is all true for both dioceses. We share a love for this state, its history, the people that live here, and the people that need us so badly in their lives. We also discovered that there is information we can share to increase our reach into the communities around us where people need to hear the words of an itinerant preacher. One of those is how the cathedral and mediator have built a relationship with the Spanish-speaking communities they serve who want to worship in the Anglican tradition. We continue to grow and discern what that all means within one faith community, but lessons learned can be shared across a wider area. At the convention, those who are from the Lancaster, Harrisburg, York areas were surprised at the success of this ministry and in some ways felt that they should have thought of it too. One of the things I do want to emphasize about reunification is what might be construed as desperation on the part of the talks is that we're not doing it through desperation. This has not been the case for others, as I mentioned. Currently, both of our dioceses are in good shape financially, though our diocese does run a bit leaner from a staffing standpoint. Part of the catalyst for this talk right now is the announced retirement of Bishop Audrey Scanlon, Bishop of Central Pennsylvania. This allows for several models for a more deliberate transition should we be called to reunify. Both bishops have reinforced to us, the committee, and anyone else they have spoken to, that this is about what is best for the people of this region and not what is best for these two individuals. But as the church shrinks, the ability to raise sufficient funds and to staff diocese and committees to do the work that Jesus calls us to do will dwindle. Being Episcopal, like I said, means having bishops. The cost of a bishop has been estimated to be at least $350,000 a year in salary, benefits, travel, and other expenses. Two dioceses could mean a smaller infrastructure to support both of them. One software package, one set of uh, buildings and grounds, things like that. Things that are fairly boring, but that provide freedom to do ministry. To take the money that we are gathering, what little we can, and put it into ministries for children, for Spanish-speaking communities, for those who are desperately needing the word of Christ. As I mentioned, it would reduce the number of committees. Standing Committee, Commission on Ministry would be one. When I visited Central Pennsylvania's convention last year, it was obvious that they are having similar problems in getting people to serve on committees, with several having just left one committee to be elected onto another. Two years ago, I ran for a spot on the Commission on Ministry and, was, and ran unopposed. It is time to dream dreams for what this church will be and mean for the generations to come. This isn't about us, it's about the people who will follow us. What might things have looked like if Robert Sayer and others didn't dream of building on the corner of 3rd and Wyandotte in South Bethlehem? Their dream led to things like Lehigh University, St. Luke's Hospital, New Bethany Ministries, Dream Dreams. Hopes of an Episcopal presence in Bethlehem began in 1854, well before the events of the Civil War that propelled Pennsylvania and the country into the Industrial Age. We don't truly know what the future holds. The prediction of 2020, 2050 as an end to the Episcopal Church 
only looks at the trends of where things are now and where they may be going if things do not change. Is reunification the answer? I say no, not on its own. What we make of the changes and how we navigate the future will be. Just as those who decided to split the diocese up, we may be doing the same thing to bring it back together to end up reacting to what God is calling us to do. It's freeing up resources for ministries, relying on a larger number of people and parishes to try new things of working and worshiping within the community we serve. That will be the answer. Let us be like Jairus or the unnamed woman and be desperate for our Savior. Through him, all things are possible. Amen.